Hey guys, so today I'm making a really exciting video. Today we are chatting with Mickey from Life with Stripes. Hi guys! So if you don't know Mickey, which I don't know why you would not know Mickey because you should know Mickey, she also has a YouTube channel and she also has EDS pots and gastroparesis among some other conditions and she talks about them on her YouTube channel. So I will leave a link to her channel down below as well as a link to the video that we just filmed. Yeah, so like Izzy said, I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about EDS um, and Izzy and I have been friends for a while now so we decided to do a video. Um, on both of our channels. Just quick about me if you don't know who I am or if you've ever seen any of my videos. Um, I'm Mickey, hi, and I'm 20 years old and I have classical EDS. I also have gastroparesis, POTS, um, a pick wine and a feeding tube, and this really cute dog named Maisie. I love Maisie. She was just sitting right there and I was like, what can I say about myself? And then I was like, dog. Today we're talking about something that's really interesting. We're actually going to go through different types of hypermobility criteria. So you probably know with EDS, the type of hypermobility test that they use, which is keep in mind only a very small part of the criteria, is something called the Baton score. And we're probably going to, we're going to go over that too, but I look so desperate, but I'm like, we're going to go over that too. <laughs> but today we're going to actually go through a bunch of the different criteria and have a discussion about it. And, um, test it for you on us, two different people with EDS. But the important thing to say is that these things are not good for you to do. So at any point, if we have a picture of us doing these things, we're gonna pop them up instead of doing it. Yeah, that way it'll kind of minimize, like if something is hard on our joints, um, if we've already done it and have a picture, that way we don't have to do it again. And you know, it's not good for your joints. And just a disclaimer, we're not doctors, we're not, um, experts or professionals, this is just coming from two patients with EDS and our opinions on it. Um, both Izzy and I have some medical knowledge, like formal medical knowledge. Um, you know, I'm in nursing school, she is going to be a genetic counselor, so like we have a little bit under our belts, um, but definitely not coming at this from like an expert perspective, um, just from, you know, two patients with EDS and our opinions. The first one, 1964, Carter and Wilkinson, good friends. Just kidding, I don't know who they are. <laughs> good friends. This was the first hypermobility test that I could find spoken about. So here they test five different things and you need to pass four of them. Just kidding, I don't know, I never looked it up. So you only need three out of the five criteria to be considered hypermobile. Uh, throughout this, Izzy and I kept getting confused um, and mixing up the criteria or the scoring with the hospital Del Mar. Uh, scoring criteria. Um, so if you're getting a little bit confused and hear us talking about 10 points rather than five, that's why. First one, passive apposition of the thumb to flex your aspect of forearm. That just means take your thumb and touch it to your wrist. Uh, I'm not sure if I have photos, but it doesn't hurt me to do it. So perfect. Right, left. That was the wrong side. Passive hyperextension of fingers so that they lie parallel to the extensor aspect of the forearm. So this is different than what we're used to. So typically you take a pinky and try to move it back, but Mickey, can you see me? What yeah. they want to see is like you go like this. Like, like this? You know what I mean? So. Okay, you I can't, can't, you can't see me, but I'm doing what you're doing. So anyway, so that would be two. That'd be four. We already passed with that. That's so easy. So we would already pass okay. with just that? What if somebody just had hypermobile hands? I think so. I know, right? Well, you know, we, we're women, so we actually we don't pass with that. Oh, right. We have to get six. Or no, men we have to get five. Four, because men are better. Apparently, men are better. No, no men are actually <laughs> typically less flexible than women. And I think it has to do with like hormones. Um, but that's why like men can yeah. be less affected than women um, when it comes to EDS. Not that like men can't have a severe case and their joints be bad, um, but I feel like in general, women are more severely affected with like their joints because they're more flexible. So just to clarify again, we did not pass yet. Um, we just confused the scoring with something else. Um, so yeah, just to clarify, our bad. Ability to hyperextend the elbow beyond 10 degrees. So one of my elbow does that, elbows does that, so I have a photo, and then one of them does not. One of them hyperextends like a smidge, but um, not like 10. So this is, and is that? I don't know what 10 degrees is, but where's my protractor? <laughs> then ability to hyperextend knees beyond 10 degrees. 
I can't do that. I can do that on both of my legs. Um, so Great. I'll put a picture, or Izzy will put a picture in here. My knees are gross. They go back really far, it's gross. <laughs> also, I think it's funny that your knees don't hyperextend, but are worse than my knees. Like, my knees do hyperextend, and yours don't, but your knees are worse than mine. Like, I think that that's funny. The next one is excessive, ra excessive range of passive dorsiflexion of the ankle and eversion of the feet. So what that means is, oh, let's look up what it means. While she says some of these things, I might be looking at my camera uh, or my phone, which actually has Izzy on FaceTime. She's in my ear, she's a secret. Um, but uh, that way I can see like exactly which motion that she's doing. So if I look down a little bit, it's to like see which motion she's doing. Um, I'm not just like staring at the floor. So dorsiflexion is like where you just bring your foot up. So I guess like one way to do that would be if you're like, you know, when you do a calf stretch. Yeah. It did not clarify if they wanted it to be weight bearing or non weight bearing for the ankle test. So I ended up looking more into it and apparently it's weight bearing and it needs to be at least 45 degrees. However, like there's a lot of studies that don't follow that, but this is technically the criteria. So I don't know why some studies don't follow it. And for reference, um, a normal range of motion of the ankle when you do like that type of um, weight bearing is up to 33.5 degrees. And I think it's as low as 16. No, it's as low as, it's as low as seven. Ooh, those poor people who can only go seven degrees. So I may have totally measured those wrong. Not a doctor, that's how you can tell. I don't know what I'm doing. Just trying to show you guys what the different hypermobility tests entail. So, so if I mess up our scoring or anything like that, um, sorry. So another clarification here. Um, Izzy and I were confused about what they meant by eversion or excessive eversion of the foot. Um, we didn't know if it meant can your foot pronate or does it pronate naturally or like it, can you make it pronate um, or is that even really what it means so we were a little bit confused on that so we apologize um, but if that is what it was referring to um, both Izzy and my feet do pronate naturally so there's just another clarification for you guys mm -mm. I make weird faces when I film when I mess up I'm like mm -hmm. We obviously both passed that test and let's discuss it so what are your thoughts Mickey um I feel like oh my voice sounded like a 14 year old boy um I feel like in general it wasn't a super in-depth like hypermobility test it was very like surface level um, and like we kind of mentioned in the beginning, like the ones that have to do with the hands, like I know lots of people who are just like double jointed in their hands, like they just have flexible hands. Um, and yeah, so that's already, called asymptomatic peripheral joint hypermobility. Fun fact, it's on it's on the yeah. List. So you know if um, if you were a guy and just had hypermobile hands and that was it, none of the rest of your body, you would actually still pass because it'd be two for each, and so you'd get four. So I feel like I mean. Which is fine, because it's a high yeah. mobility test, not an yeah. EBS test. Right. So, so you expect 20% of people to pass. I guess that's to true. Of people I'm pass. thinking at it more from an EBS perspective versus hypermobile. So I should definitely keep that in mind. Um, However, but, the point is, are we gonna, should we be using this for the EDS test? Yeah. I think it's more in depth than the Baton score, which we will do in a little bit next, actually. The difference I like is that it includes your foot, whereas like in the yeah. ankle, whereas the other one like doesn't, the Baton yeah. score doesn't. And then also it like includes all of your fingers as opposed to just your pinky, um, yeah. which I think is more telling with hypermobility in my in my like I don't know many people yeah. who can like flat out do this now that I'm thinking about it like it seems easy but then I'm thinking yeah. like I feel like people don't do that next what we're going to be doing is technically it was called the Baton and Horan joint mobility index it's now called the Baton score yep. so let's get into it first two can you touch your thumb to your wrist one point each pinky can you make it more than 90 degrees actually I don't want to hurt my pinky so don't you okay Mickey's just going to go ahead this. and do them because apparently it does not hurt her body. Um, yeah, this. okay. Yeah. Ouchie. Yeah, that is definitely more. Um, next, you have to bend down with your legs straight and touch your hands to the floor. We will do that like right now. Hyperextend elbows, 10 degrees. Hyperextend your knees. I actually 
actually like so this one this one wasn't included in the in the previous test um, and I I liked this one um, but also so when I was originally diagnosed with EDS this is the scale that I had to do um, and I was able to do this at that point in time um, and I'm still able to do it but I cannot anymore like at this current point in time I cannot do that um, for two reasons. One, my back is all messed up um, and bending down is really, really hard. And um, two, my hamstrings are so incredibly tight um, because of the laxity in my knees and in my hips. Like, and just all, my legs are like really unstable, so my muscles get super, super tight to compensate for that. Um, and so, like, my hamstrings go through periods where they're really, really, really tight. Um, and so I can bend down and, you know, touch my palms flat to the floor, um, but just not currently because of the state that I'm yeah. in. Um, so, and I think that it varies based on, you know, whatever, but this one wasn't included in the other one, so. I don't like this because agreed so I have really tight hamstring well not really but I do have tighter hamstrings and so this one depends more on flexibility as well as hypermobility so just because you're hypermobile like for yeah. me I can easily you know like take my leg put it behind my head I can like you know do that and stuff like my leg bent because it's supposed to be your hips but then like talking about hamstring like they're not that loose you know so it's like yeah. I don't think it's a proper measure Interestingly, right after saying this, I actually looked into the hands on the floor maneuver to see if, I guess, anybody has ever done a study on it. And there's actually a study called, does the item hands on the floor add value to the bait and score in identifying joint hypermobility? Their argument is that it depends a lot on the flexibility of your hamstrings, which is exactly what Mickey and I were just saying. Um, and their conclusion was that it does not add value to the score. So yeah. <laughs> And also, I spoke to, I think his name is Malfi. I don't actually know how to say his name. Mal Malfi. Um, <laughs> at the EDS conference a few years ago. Out. And I. On the screen. Yeah, <laughs> right there. And I asked him, you know, why are you using the bait and score? I'm just curious. I feel like it doesn't test very much. I'd love to hear your opinion. And he said he want, they, they're looking into replacing it as well. Um, yeah. For a while. Um, so. Which is not, it, like, it's not don't take our word for it. Like, that was word of mouth. Um, like, that was what. Yeah. So that was what he said, so, um, but yeah. like, don't don't take our word for it and be like, oh, they are changing it. Um, yeah, just that, I know you know, they're saying. considering changing they're, it. They're considering changing it, yeah. um, which I think they should change. If they're going to change it, I think they should change it to Hospital Del Mar, which, Mickey, yes. that's our next one. All righty, I'm ready. Um, and this is by, I think it's maybe, I think it was created in 1992 by Bulbina. Bulbana. So basically, Hospital Del Mar is out of 10 points, and in order to be considered hypermobile, you need four if you're a guy, five if you're a female. Keep in mind, hypermobility is common. We're not yeah. talking about EDS. Hypermobility is a symptom of EDS, but hypermobility in and of itself is a thing. So it's just a it's also a symptom of Down syndrome, you know? Like, yeah. it does not equal EDS yep. in itself. Just like keep that in mind. So if you're like, oh my god, I'm hypermobile, do I have EDS? Probably not. Uh, I mean, if you're like concerned, if you've had all the issues, of course, bring it up, yeah. like yeah. totally and look into it. Okay, so this one is my absolute favorite and it tests upper extremities, lower extremities in a supine position, lower extremities in a prone position, and then ecchymosis. Yep, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know what it is. I have no idea what it's like. Yeah. Passive opposition of the thumb to the flexor of the forearm. That's thumb to, to wrist. We got that. Yep. One each or, or just, just one in general. Do you want to like count our scores on both. the screen? Like metacrophalangeal. Hmm. Okay. Basically, the point is, can you touch your? Can you can you take your pinky and make it greater than ninety? Yeah. Yeah. We already did that. that. So that's we have two points. Um, elbow hyperextension greater than ten. You get a yes. yes. I get a I don't freaking know because I can only do it on one, and I don't know okay. if that's like it doesn't say both elbows, so I'm assuming it means at least one. Like yeah. Um. Oh oh I got it. Oh, to score, each side is calculated separately, giving a left score and a right score. Each yes is given one mark. A total score of 10 marks is available. So basically that means I have two and a half and you have three. There we go. Got it, okay. External shoulder rotation. With the, oh, this is so good. With the upper, <laughs> so good. I just mean it's different. With the upper arm <laughs> touching the body, so like this, like with your arm parallel like this. Okay. Um, and your 
your elbow at a 90 degree angle. So the forearm is taken an external rotation of greater than 85 degrees in the sagittal plane, shoulder to shoulder line. So this is literally so easy. They literally just want you to be at least eight, at least 85. Literally, I'm like way more than that. And you can do that too. So I can do that. So like if you're so. sideways to do like this, like rotate your arm. Yeah, maybe like pull it a little more. This but way? Yeah, exactly. We're already at like more than 90. So we're good. So we each get one. Ow. So, or we got a point now. So we have, okay. Oh. Okay. Up here. I love that because it's like including other things. Hip abduction. The passive hip abduction can be taken at an angle of greater than 85 degrees. Okay, one, two. Okay. Mickey can do that too, but we forgot to record it. But then also, that might not be what they mean by the passive, what is it? Passive hip abduction. There's like a bunch of ways to do hip abduction and I just, it like doesn't clarify, so that's just the one that we did, but it could be wrong. Patellar hypermobility, we'll do that after this. With one hand holding the proximal end of the tibia, the patella can be moved well to all sides with the other hand. Oh, can we move to the sides with the other hand? Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> yes, for me. Um, like, yes, yeah, so bad they had to get surgeries. Ankle and feet hypermobility. An excessive range of passive dorsiflexion of the ankle and a version of the foot can be produced. Metatarsal phalangeal dorsiflexion of the toe of the foot over the di diaphysis of the first metatarsal greater than 90 degrees. Okay. So I think they mean, can you take your toe, your big toe, and make it greater than 90 degrees? Yes. I've got to get my feet. Ooh, feet. I think I hurt my wrist doing that. Like make your see. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, uh. I don't hurt yourself. I just went until it stopped on its own. That's kind of what I did too, but I don't know. I just feel like you're really hypermobile, so I don't want to like make you like hurt. <laughs> like I'm nervous. I'm not gonna hurt myself. I'm not gonna like with the I don't one be that was, like, feet. Like put your hands on the ground. I just said I'm not gonna be able to do that one. Like I'm not gonna hurt myself if it's gonna hurt. Totally. Me. Knee hyperextension or knee hyperflexion. Oh, oh, this one's good. This is different. Oh, I like it. Can you take your heel and touch it to your butt? Can people not? Yes, of course I can. I used to. Did you do this in like school when you were little, where you'd run and like kick yourself in the butt as you would run? Yeah. Are like, you wait, I, do that? I'm so confused. But that's literally what that means. Knee hyperflexion. You would run and like kick yourself in the butt. As you yeah, run. knee flexion allows the heel to make contact with the buttock. Yeah. Echimosis, or the appearance of this thing after hardly noticed minimal traumatism. Basically, if you look it up, I'm actually going to text it to you because it's like weird stuff. But it's like a type of bruise that like, I feel like happens in like classical like EDS. It's like very like, here, I'm texting this to you. Definitely had that before. Okay, so I'm not positive with this one, but I do have like a bad bruise right now. And I also can like put up another image that I found that I feel like might be however the heck you pronounce this word. Okay, you see how this is like kind of like dark and weird looking. I'm really not positive, but like maybe. I definitely think this one was the most thorough of the three hypermobility tests that we did. Um, I actually had never heard of this one before. Doing this video was the first time that I was introduced to it. Um, and like doing these tests, never done them before. Um, so this was my first reaction. I've never heard of them either. Yeah. Like I've, I've read them, but no, like I've never seen yep. them like anywhere because I think they're like outdated. Yeah, which is well, technically which is these are this one's odd. newer. Yeah, it amazing. is. It is. I know what you mean though. Um, yeah, which is odd though because this one is like, it seems like it's the best. Um, I mean, in my opinion, but um, I think the reason that they do the other one is because it's faster and easier, so that a physician can do it really quickly. But like, what bothers me is like. There's a big difference between somebody who can do literally all of these or most of them and somebody who can just do a couple of them and yeah. like pass. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like it just, it feels very, very different. And like, I know I'm very hypermobile, but like just on like my knees don't hyperextend, which is like great. I mean, my knee literally dislocated so freaking badly and like continued to sublux. Like yeah. clearly I got knee problems. My knees hyperextend really bad. Hers don't, but her knees are worse than mine. Like it's not always, it, right. Hypermobility doesn't always necessarily correlate to the severity of the joint, but 
I also feel like, like we actually quickly mentioned this the other day to each other, but like hypermobility and instability aren't necessarily the same thing. Yes. And like so many hypermobile people are not really unstable. They might be slightly more unstable because they're hypermobile, but like they're not dislocating. Their their bones are not moving. If you do, as we were saying, if you do like the ACL test, we fail. If you do like saying that we may have a messed up ACL, even though we don't, well, I don't, I don't know what you I do. Don't. Um, or like my wrist, you know, it's like, they clunk like it does the clunk yep. test that passes it fails so it's like that's instability and i don't know why they don't test for it because yeah. it's like that i think is a little bit potentially more yeah. more finish off that sentence i mean it's more like indicative more. of eds versus like just hypermobile um but at least in, in my it's opinion, more better um so like for instance i had um an orthopedic specialist who every time um she would evaluate my shoulders uh, for not just like hypermobile, but not just for hypermobility, but instability. Um, and we would check up on it every couple months when I saw her. Um, and she would, you know, take her hands and like move my shoulder, feel, like see, okay, if I if I touch it, like does it move? Kind of like wiggle it, feel how it like um, examining more for like instability as well as hypermobility. Um, and so I think, but also like you know. I think it's important to say like everybody's different so like not necessarily everyone with EDS is going to have super unstable joints um, because everyone you know everyone is so different it's such a big spectrum um, but yeah I think this this test would be closer to testing for instability than the other ones but I feel like so far there's not a whole lot of that in the testing um, or these evaluations yeah totally um what do you think have you ever just subluxed a knee or dislocated a knee yes like many times to the point where it broke what do you my think leg is the, <laughs> what do you think is the worst joint to dislocate and there's two questions what do you think is the worst joint to dislocate like most painful and then what is the most disgusting joint to dislocate do you know what i mean yeah because like as long as that sign dislocates it is the disgustingness of the feel is just unparalleled by anything else in the world uh by far the most disgusting joint is my hips because they they don't really look super weird but the noise it's so loud it's such a big like clunk it's like oh my goodness when my bedroom was next to my parents they joked that they would know when i woke up in the morning because they would hear the clunks of me putting my hips back into place because they come out when i sleep like it's so loud it's so gross um i would say the most painful definitely has to be in my spine so like in my neck and my spine when things shift that is so painful um and like so anything in like my back so like from my neck and i don't like fully dislocate vertebrae um but like things will i will subluxate them to where they're like shifted off um and that is so painful i would say that's probably got to be anywhere in my spine so like and I'm including my SI joints in that, so like kind of spine and pelvis, because my SI joints are also so painful. It was really weird is if I sublux, I've never dislocated, but if I sublux an SI joint or an elbow, it is ungodly painful for three seconds, and that's fine. Really? I, I mean, then it hurts a bit. Oh yeah, like it doesn't swell. It, I mean, the, it's, mm, sometimes, but it rarely swells. It doesn't get hot. Like I don't really know how to explain it, but when it happens oh my god it's like i will scream mm -hmm. but it only is so freaking painful for like a second and then yeah, it like, I have so quickly like diminishes too. i i know that's but like why? my fingers what? for me that's my fingers like how could you be that painful and then be fine a moment later like how yeah so for me that's my fingers like when it happens it's like ah! but then it like i mean i could put it back in and it's it gets better really pretty quickly it's just sore for a little bit but um no i know what you're yeah i know what right. you're talking about um, it's so weird, but like, if, yeah. so like when you, if you were to sublux or dislocate, I guess, an SI joint, is it going to swell and bruise? No. Um, so for me, like I actually have really bad SI joints right now. So like my left one is totally uh, fine. It comes out of place, but it's fine. My right one, um, is like mega unstable and like comes out like eight times a day. Like I haven't seen a doctor for this for the past like six months, um, because I'm actually like growing extra bone to try to reinforce it. Like it's just, it's a, it's a big old pain in the literal butt. Um, so, yeah, no, but it doesn't swell or bruise, 
I, I'm trying to think of really any joints that swell and bruise when I dislocate them. Um, My knees. <laughs> oh, and a rib a little bit. But like, well, it'll bruise. It won't swell, but it'll bruise. You know what I mean? It really but, depends um, on the type of dislocation. Like, if it's a really traumatic one, um, or it happens like, I guess if it's really traumatic, that would be the only time where it really swells or bruises. Um, otherwise, it just hurts and looks gross. <laughs> like yeah. my shoulder. I guess to me, like for this one, you can see my shoulders out of place here. It sits like this all the time. So then, like, here's the ball of my shoulder, and then it goes. I feel like that was like me with my knee with every There's step. Like, ugh. Yeah. But for me, the reason I asked is just because it's so freaking gross when my knee would slip off. Like the feeling is unparalleled by anything else I've ever felt. It's the disgustingness that like I feel yeah. like I. It is so wrong. Like the feeling. That's it's like whereas feet. other ones just hurt. Yeah, like some of them just hurt, and you're like, ow, but like it didn't feel wrong. Like it feels wrong. Yeah. After Mickey and I hung up, I actually had this idea to see if there were any studies done that compared any of these hypermobility tests. And I was able to find one that compares the Hospital Del Mar and the Baton score using the exact same children. And I found something interesting. And at first I was feeling discouraged because the study says that only 12% of people pass the Baton score, which is like right on par with how many hypermobile people there are. Um, keep in mind these were children, so they're a bit more hypermobile, but anyway, 12% with Baton and 34 with Hospital Del Mar. So I was thinking to myself, okay, just kidding, I guess Baton's a lot better. But then I read more into it and I'm like, what? Basically, two of the tests are like should really not be in there in my personal opinion because the one of them, which is where your heel touches your butt, 97% of the kids pass that and then 80% of the kids pass the one where we do that shoulder rotation thing like this. So why are they on there? Take them off and then I'm pretty sure the Hospital Del Mar would be better because you just took out so many of the people who were able to get a couple of points in a place that's like really easy to get points like it just doesn't make any sense because at that point it's no longer hyper mobile it's just now regular mobile <laughs> if like they're not a hyper you know like more than the normal because that seems to be the normal so like i don't i don't get it i'm confused so basically i guess the point is maybe i should propose a corn blouse score where it's basically the hospital del mar and you take out those two because there really is a big jump between those and the next most popular popularly passed one which is the thumb to the wrist um 31 so that's a really big difference and if you're curious about the other numbers by the way because i find this interesting 27 percent had hypermobile elbows 16 percent um the the toe thing 15.5 percent hips 10 percent finger 10% knee, 6% ankle, 4% bending down, touching the ground, and then 2% patella. So I feel like that's kind of telling which ones we should potentially be putting into the EDS test. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously this is not an EDS test. This is just a hypermobility test, but I don't know. Just thought I'd say it. That's my tangent. Mickey, thank you so much for coming on my channel. Yes. Uh, I had so yeah. much fun filming with you today, both on my Same. channel as well as on yours. Yes. Um, I would really highly recommend checking out the video that we did on Mickey's channel. I think that it's more of a discussion based video, which I would love to do more of in the future. But I just, this one was kind of fun. I feel like we couldn't give up the opportunity to yes. do this video. I was so excited when you, um, when you brought up this video idea. I was like, oh my goodness, that sounds like so much fun. Um, and it was. So, and I learned something. I had never done or heard of the last type of mobile score before. So, I learned something, which I often do when I talk to Izzy. <laughs> Um, so anyway, thanks again, and we will see you guys, or I will see you, but maybe Mickey on a future run on the next video. <laughs> Bye! Yes, for sure. Bye!